Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. How are you? Fine, fine, fine. Hello, Sulek. <laughs> hey, Gary. Jajananda. Jajananda. <laughs> After a long time, I'm doing a darshan. Yes. <laughs> Deepak Bhai Jayajinan. Jayajinendra Sulek Bhai. Jayajinendra to all our viewers. And we are going to conduct today our ninth Acharya Mahapragya Ji's birth centenary lecture. So to start with this, I just wanted to let you know that Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of USA said, you may delay time, but time will not. If not now, when? If later, why? Stewarding your time and life is as powerful as you're watching this video. I am so proud that you're here and you're connected with us as our viewers. I believe that it is a true testament to your desire to be your greatest version and give your best in life, make an impact and live your purpose. You're doing it right now. You're watching this YouTube version of our webinar, and you are with us today. One thing we will never get more of is time. Here is the fact, no matter how successful, powerful, famous, or rich someone is, they are still going to have the same amount of time in the day that you and I have, that is 24 hours. <clears throat> It's how they spend those hours each day that differentiates them from the rest of the world. One of the most valuable commodities is that we all steward our time well. What we give to is so important in how successful we will actually be when we investigate history. And that's where Acharya Mahapragyaji is we're celebrating his 100th birth centenary. So it, famous people, what they have left the legacy and how we are propagating it, that is so important. I always imagined that their lack of time wasn't their excuse, but their drive to have more to do. Leonardo Caprio, DiCaprio, he starred in 36 movies, only winning an Oscar in his latest at 41 years old. And it is mind boggling that if he did not steward his gift well, he might have not gotten his Oscar. Sam Walton, yes. the founder of Walmart, at 44 years old, one of the fastest growing massive supermarkets. <laughs> Leo Goodwin founded Geigo at, at the age of 50. Gordon Bulker founded Starbucks at the age of 51. Charles Flint founded IBM at age of 61. The average age of the president of United States is 55 years old, the youngest 42 and the oldest 69 years old. Pablo Picasso completed one of his masterpieces at the age of 55. I am getting so excited right now. J.R.R. Tolkien published the first volume of his fantasy series of the Lord of Rings at the age of 62. Noah Webster completed his monumental American dictionary of the English language at the age of 66 years old. The oldest person to climb Mount Everest was 71 years old. John Glenn went into space as the oldest person at 77 years old. I don't know if you're seeing the red thread here, but these people showed that if time was steward, you will be seen for your hard work and dedication to the dream on your life. Just wanted to say that as Jain, we, adopt, we adapted Jainism and we are the propagators of Jain. So how Acharya Mahaprakirji brought Jainism and science together. And today we are listening to his lecture series with these amazing diamonds, like I always say, who are part of our lecture series and our viewers who have been connected with us all this time, just wanted to let you know that we as Jains who adapted Jainism, it is our job to propagate and show the world what Jainism principles are. So with further ado, I would like to call upon Dr. Eric Larson, who's the chair of our religious department at FIU, who would introduce our honorable speaker. Dr. Good Larson. morning, everyone. On behalf of Dean John Stack and the Green School of International Public Affairs and the Department of Religious Studies, it's my privilege to welcome you to this morning's lecture. In English, there's a saying about scholars who live in ivory towers. And it basically refers to the idea that 
in order to create knowledge, um, you have to seclude yourself and spend a lot of time in deep thought and consideration. But yet at the end of the day, um, all knowledge should have a practical effect. And I'm very happy that at FIU, um, our president is fully committed. He often tells us that um, his goal for the university is to be a, a leading public research institution with community engagement. And I love that in our um, Green School of International and Public Affairs, the motto of the school is creating a just, peaceful, and prosperous world. With these uh, ideas, I have to tell you that we couldn't have had better partners than um, those in the Jane Education and Research Foundation and um, our wonderful Jane friends in the Jane community here in South Florida uh, and all around the, the country. We're so happy to, to partner with you all to um, learn and study more about this wonderful Jane tradition, but also to make changes. And I see those changes in our students um, as they take classes on Jainism and learn and think about the kind of people that they want to become. And so I'm very happy also for this lecture series to highlight some of the ways that the Jainism um, interacts with the world in which we live with modern science um, and with a practical effect. So this morning we have a very uh, great treat in store for us. We are very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Gary Francioni, who is Board of Governors Distinguished Professor of Law and Nicholas Katzenbach Scholar of Law and Philosophy at Rutgers University. He served as a law clerk to Justice Sandra Day O'Connor of the United States Supreme Court, and he practiced law before entering teaching in 1984. Professor Francioni is the author of numerous books and articles on animal rights, theory, and ve veganism. He himself has been a vegan for 38 years based on his acceptance of the principle of ahimsa or nonviolence, and he rejects the use of all animal products, including dairy, leather, wool, and silk. He's a serious student of Jain philosophy and has published on Jainism and animal ethics. He delivered the opening keynote address at the 15th biannual Jaina convention in July, 2009, and has spoken at other Jain events as well. Um, he also completed a series of interviews for uh, Mangalam, the Jain TV program. So with that, um, it's my pleasure to uh, present to you this morning, Professor Francioni, and he will speak to us on Jainism and relativity. Professor Francioni, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I also appreciated uh, Deep's discussion because she made me feel that even though those of us who are getting older, we can still do things. <laughs> so I, I feel, I feel, you know, that there's still still some 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 left in here. Um, let me share my screen with you, um, and um, okay, or my yeah, yeah I want to share my PowerPoint here. Actually, oh, I want to share that. All right, going back to the beginning. Okay. Now. Is there some, somebody who's better with these technological things than I, which means basically everybody in the room. Um, at the top of my screen, there is a mute stop video security participants, etc. bar that stops me from seeing the, um, the slideshow bar. Um, is there some way, because I want to, oh, wait a minute, here, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it from the beginning. Okay, there we go. All right, very good. Okay, my topic is Jainism and relativism. And um, I wanna thank the Jane Education and Research Foundation, the Jane Center of South Florida, and the Florida International University Department of uh, Religious Studies. Uh, and that introduction from Dean Larson, uh, I wanna thank you for hosting this and for inviting me. I also wanna thank uh, Acharya Mahapragya, whose birthday, whose hundredth birthday this is celebrating. Uh, you can't see in, in back of me now, uh, there is, or if you can see the little thumbnail, you can see over here, that is my, my, my diploma from Preksha Meditation. 
that was taught to me by Samani Murit Pragya, who is now Sadvi Mimansa Prabha, uh, and, Sa and, and Samani Shukla Pragya, who's now Sadvi uh, Samta Prabha. And they taught me Preksha meditation. And over here actually is the Namakar Mantra. And there's a picture of Acharya Bhikshu, Acharya Tulsi, Acharya Mahapragya, and Acharya uh, 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 Mahashraman. Uh, and so I'm a uh, big, big devotee of the uh, Terapants. Okay, the centerpiece of the Jain doctrine of relativism is Anikantvad. Anikantvad is an ontological doctrine. It's an ontological doctrine because it concerns the nature of existence, of what is. It claims that reality is irreducibly complex. All substances are complex and each has innumerable characteristics, qualities, modes, relations, facets, and aspects. Because reality is complex, we who are not kevel who have who, who, who have omniscience as it were, those of us who do not have kevel gyan cannot have pramana or knowledge of, or, or full knowledge of reality. We can only know things from a particular point of view. So the Jain doctrine of Anikantvad says that reality is irreducibly complex. The Jain doctrine of Nayavada is that we can only know, those of us who are, who are not cable gyan can only know things from particular perspectives. That is the doctrine of Nayavada. The doctrine of Sayavada is the linguistic or logical extension of, of that um, in that we cannot make categorical statements about substances because we can't have full knowledge of those substances. We can only speak from a particular naya or perspective. And we can only make statements about with, from within the naya or perspective. And those statements always need to be qualified because they, all, they always need to be qualified because they can only at best reflect the particular naya from which they are made. So we have Anikantvada that tells us that re reality is irreducibly complex. We have Nayavada, which tells us that we can't know absolute reality. All we can do is know a reality from particular perspectives. And Sayavada, which tells us that we can't speak in absolute proposi uh, uh, propositions. The Jain theory of relativism is very, very different from the theory of relativism is understood in the West. This is extremely important and it's extremely important because as I'm gonna argue in a few minutes, I think a problem is that many Jains tend to collapse the Jain theory of relativism into the Western theory of relativism. And I think that that's a fundamental mistake. In, in the West, in, in philosophical, uh, you know, in Western philosophy, relativism means that truth, the truth of anything or, or the truth of morality has to exist in relationship to some culture or society or historical con context. There is no absolute truth. I, I, I think that that is very different, completely different from Jane relativism that, that maintains that there is absolute truth but there is not absolute truth that we can know. We can only know it from a particular perspective. But there is an absolute truth out there. If we were cable gyan, if we were, if we had, if we attained vitaraga, if we were, if we were, if we were liberated, if we could see clearly, then we would see the absolute reality. But we're not. So we cannot understand reality in the pramana sense, the full, the absolute sense. We can only understand it from the sense of the, 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 the naya. Now, the historical basis of nayavada, of all of this actually, the entire doctrine of Anikantvad, was to try to steer a middle path between the Buddhists who had this idea of radical impermanence, that nothing was permanent, and the, the Hindu Brahmanic position that, that talked about, had a very strong sense of permanence. And the Jain position, the middle path, was that reality was both permanent and impermanent. So that's the historical, that, that it developed, the, 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 the doctrine of Anikantvad, Nayavad, Sayavad, developed as a sort of a middle path um, as between the Buddhist notion of, of
Gary, you got muted. We cannot hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Have I been muted from the beginning? No, 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 no. Just oh. last two sentences. Last oh, okay, two sentences. fine, fine. Thank you very much because I got a note that the host had muted me. Um, I was wondering if I said something wrong. Michami Dupa, Michami Dupa, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, okay, so the the Jain theory was the was the 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 middle path between the Buddhist notion of impermanence and the Hindu notion of 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 permanence. Okay. It is crucial to understand that that anikanta nayadvad is primarily about substances. It's a doctrine that applies to substances. When it talks about the perspectives on reality, it's talking about reality in terms of substances, jiv souls, pudgal matter, dharma motion, adharma rest, akasa space, kala time, and the modes of these substances. So I don't know why my, um, okay. All right, so the seven nayas, there are seven nayas, seven of these, these and nayavad comprises seven different perspectives. Although there are probably many more, there are seven primary perspectives and they deal with what we call dravya naya and paryaya naya, that is, the 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 substance is and the modes of the substances. We cannot make absolute statements about the substances because the statements are are permanent in one sense and impermanent in another. The problem is that in more recent times, Anikantvad, which originally developed to talk about the world, reality has been used sort of as this radical doctrine of pluralism, that, that it originally started with religious pluralism, but now it has been applied to, it, 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 it is used to support a form of moral pluralism. That is, there is no right or wrong. You know, there's no absolute right or wrong. Anikantvad, you know, is, is, is evoked. I think that this is problematic. And I think it's problematic for two reasons. Because anikantvad, nayadvad, and sidevad are all about substances and modes of substances. And, and so to try to start applying these things to religious, to religions, or to moral situations is problematic because it's taking anikantvad from the context in which it was developed and applying it in a situation that Number two, reduces Jainism to the Western doctrine of relativism, which denies absolute truth. That is the problem. Now, to the extent that you are, you're talking, say, about Christianity, and you say that, you know, Christianity talks about love and, and, and you know, uh, uh, Jainism talks about vitaraga and sort of no, no attachment, no, no, no avoidance, uh, uh, sort of, a, you know, you can say, well, you know, this is, these are the ideal states and they're described from different perspectives, but we're really talking about the ideal states in both of these religions and love in a Christian, love in, a, in, a, in the Christian sense um, is, is really not about passionate love, it's about agapistic love. It's about non-passionate love. It's about the idea of the identification of the self with the other and to care about the other as much as one cares about the self and to have no attachments that in which one values others more than one values everyone. That is the ideal of Christian love. Now that's not very much talked about, but that is the ideal of Christian love. In many ways, it is very, very close to the Jain notion of no attachment, no avoidance, and vitraga. It's very, very, very close. You know, the 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 Jain doctrine, as I understand it, and as I was taught uh, it, um, doesn't say that. I shouldn't have concern about everyone. It says I shouldn't have concern for any one person more than I do for any other person. And so, and I should not allow my, my behavior to be influenced by 
any passionate feelings that I have for particular people. So one can say, well, in that sense, you know, you can look at Christianity and the doctrine of love, and you can look at Jainism and the doctrine of Vitanaga, and you can see some similarities, okay? But in this case, what we're the substance that we're talking about is really the soul, right? The jeev. You're talking, you're, 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 so you are talking about substances. But there is a sense in which it's not consistent. You can't say all religions are true because you've got a situation with Christianity. Christianity says the world was created by God, by a God. And the God, there's a God that there's a creator, and that that love is a commandment, um, and and you know it's not it's you know it, it's not it's not something that that is required for liberation as a matter of the physics of jiv and ajiv and the involvement of karma. You know you, you can't say these things are are in conflict. So you can't say well you know you th that 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 Jainism is completely reconcilable with Christianity. It's not. There may be aspects, important aspects important aspects which can be understood in terms of, you know, of, of similar ideas in both religious traditions, but they are not consistent, okay, in, in other, other ways. Morality, particularly issues of fundamental, fun, fundamental issues of morality, killing, killing, murder, rape, can't be accommodated in this sort of framework. When we're talking about serious issues of fundamental rights and morality, we can't really say, we can't say, well, it's a matter of anikantva. Let me give you an example, veganism. Veganism, most Jains are vegetarians. As a matter of fact, I've never met a Jain and I've met thousands of them. I've never met a Jain who, I'm sure that I've met Jains who are not vegetarians, but no one's ever admitted to not being a vegetarian. Everybody, every Jain I've ever met says they're a vegetarian. Problem is, many Jains, most Jains that I've met, are not vegans. So they don't consume meat, but they consume dairy and they consume, you know, they have milk, they have ghee, they have butter. They wear, you know, they, they use dairy in, 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 in puja events. They use, you know, they, they, they wear silk, they wear leather. Um, all of these things involve, you know, contain animal products. Now, all animal products, including dairy, all of them, involve suffering and death imposed on mobile five-sensed beings, okay? Some forms of production are more brutal than other forms of production, but the, under the very best of circumstances, under the very most humane of circumstances, th there's a great deal of suffering that is involved in the production of these products. And death is a necessary aspect of any industry or practice that uses animals. We can't be using animals in any institutionalized way where death is not involved in, you know, the death of animals is not involved in that process. There's no such thing. Animals used in dairy products, for dairy production, are kept alive longer than animals used for meat. And, and they are treated worse and, and end up in the same slaughterhouses than animals that are used for meat. The male babies of dairy cows are sold into the veal industry. Most of the females are used in the dairy industry. It's an endless cycle of suffering, exploitation, and death. There's an inextricable relationship between the meat industry and the dairy industry. And the problem is not just in the United States or other Western countries, okay? Uh, for example, this is an article from Statecraft, which talks about, and there's a million, there's, a, there's, there's many such articles. Um, in which we are told that India is the second largest beef exporter in the world. Second largest. India is the second largest beef exporter in the world after Brazil. Okay. Um, and the Indian livestock sector contributed about 4.5% of India's total GDP in 2015, 2016. This is... Um, Trying to see if I can get this thing on here. Okay. India is the world's largest milk producer with 22% of global production, followed by the United States of America, China, Pakistan, and Brazil. That's from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. So India is exporting the second largest exporter of, of beef and the largest milk producer in the entire world. This is written by a man named Sagar Shaw. He is British, he's a Jain. And Sagar has traveled around India, has written extensively on, um, on, on, on uh, the treatment of animals in India. 
And this is something from him, although you, he's written an enormous amount on this. The treatment of cows and buffalo is associated with dairy cooperatives is full of violence. Cows and bulls are premature, pre prematurely sent for slaughter, often across states. Cows often suffer from inflamed udders. Calves are separated from their mothers. There is an in, there's inadequate protection from the elements. And there are cruel reproductive programs involving artificial insemination and cross breeding with non-native breeds. Moreover, much of the other milk available in India comes from private dairies or tabellas where conditions are even worse. So, so Sagar's argument is that even in the Indian cooperatives, which are thought to be producing less, you know, uh, ahimsa milk, it's not ahimsa at all. That, you know, it, some milk production may involve less himsa than other milk production, but it cannot, other milk production, but it can't be doubted that all milk production involves at least some himsa under the best of circumstances, some himsa inflicted on mobile five sensed beings. So this is a serious issue. You know, this is a serious issue. And, and what concerns me is that it seems that many Jains have drawn a very artificial line between meat and all other animal products. Now I understand there are historical reasons for that, but the historical reasons for that or traditions, I'm gonna to get to this in a second, but the historical reasons for that and the traditions cannot justify if something is wrong, if something is, is ahimsic, then it needs to be explored. It needs to be, it cannot be accepted simply because it's been done for a long time or because historically Jainism grew up in a country in which Hinduism was a much larger Dharma, a, a much larger tradition and influenced Jainism. Um, and, and, you know, we have this idea about, about milk being less problematic than meat. I would respectfully suggest you can't make that argument. There's no morally coherent distinction between meat and other animal products. Many people still hold the idyllic concept of the dairy cow that grazes in the pasture, is provided with good care, and has had a good life. If milk or other pro uh, products come from such an animal, how can they be morally problematic? Well, in the first place, no animal products come from such animals. Almost all dairy products, wherever in the world they are produced, come from animals kept in intensive conditions known as factory farming. They involve unspeakable brutality and violence. Even those that are raised in free range circumstances or whose products are, are advertised as organic or whatever, they may be slightly less brutal than the factory farm, like the, like the Indian dairy cooperatives. I'm sure that the Indian dairy cooperatives are not as bad as Western factory dairy farms, but they still involve violence, suffering, and death. You know, the person who keeps the, the one, you know, only one cow, let's say, well, you know, but my great, great grandmother used to have one cow. Well, you know, you were probably very little when you're, when you're, with your great great grandmother, and maybe you didn't observe the things that you would observe as an adult. But the person who keeps only one cow on his or her property has to keep that cow pregnant in order to give milk. And that means that there will be a steady stream of calves. And in most cases, most of those calves will end up on someone's table. And whenever a calf is separated from the mother, there is a tremendous amount of suffering. I must say, I have been in slaughterhouses. I have been in, on factory farms. I've seen a lot of things in my life that I really frankly wished I didn't see. But one of the worst things I've ever seen, and I really mean this, is watching the separation of a calf from the calf's mother. The, the mother gets very agitated. She cries. She tries to follow the calf. It's really, really horrible. The idea of the, of the, 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 the cow grazing happily in the field and being a member of the family and whatnot, this is a fantasy. It is a fantasy. However we produce these products, however humane they may be, they involve himsa. It is important. It is crucial for us as Jains to understand that, that it involves himsa. And it involves himsa imposed on mobile multi-sense beings. And, you know, we are mobile <laughs> multi-sense beings. So in a sense, we aren't supposed to, we aren't supposed to make distinctions amongst mobile multi-sense beings. Um, and we are five sense beings. And most of the animals we exploit are five sense beings. So, it is important for us to understand that however humane the, 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 the process is, it involves himsa. There's no getting away from that. Now, the arguments I've, I, I, there, there are several arguments I've, I've encountered when I talk to Jane's about this. One is, well, it's, it's possible to produce milk without himsa. 
So it's okay to consume milk. Well, let's think about that for a second. First of all, I would suggest it is impossible to produce milk without HIMSA. It is impossible. You can't do it. And, you know, uh, I've been told that that, uh, well, in, in some of these smaller dairy cooperatives, the calf is allowed to drink as much milk as the calf wants to drink. Sagar Shah, who has visited these many, if not most of these cooperatives, uh, writes extensively that the calves are not permitted to drink. They can't drink what they want to drink from the mother because if they did, there would not be enough milk left over for human consumption. So there are, they have all sorts of things where, you know, the, the, where the, the calf has a ring in the nose that's got little spikes on it so that the calf cannot, cannot drink comfortably. You know, the mother gets upset and sort of pushes the calf away, et cetera. There are all sorts of ways that sometimes the calf is just kept in, you know, different parts of the, of the, 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 the yard or the area. Um, they are often, they often have their, their snouts tied and things like that. So this idea that, well, you know, it's all very natural. It's not natural at all uh, because you can't have it be natural and still have enough milk left for human consumption. The other argument I've gotten is that it's tradition. Uh, people say, well, you know, yes, I know I'm not a vegan, but it's tradition. You know, I, I mean, I, very few of us are, very few of us are, 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 are vegan. Um, and it's a tradition. We drink milk in our, in our chai. We consume ghee in our, we use ghee in our cooking, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we wear silk, we wear wool, um, we wear leather. Um, and, and these are traditions. But if Jainism means anything, if Jainism has any intellectual pull it requires that we reject tradition. It's a, it's a dharma that requires that we examine all of our beliefs rationally and that we look at things in a rational way. Tradition, relying on tradition is the opposite of, 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 exam, of rational examination. It's the opposite of rational examination. If something is wrong, the fact that we've been doing it for a long time doesn't make it right. There are all sorts of things that human beings have been doing for a long, long time. Wars, for example, discrimination, for example, injustice, for example. The fact that those things have been done for a long time doesn't make them right. And I'm sure you would all agree with me as Jains. And it's not just a problem with dairy. You know, wool, the shearing of sheep for wool involves an unspeakable amount of violence. The animals are frightened. I don't know if you've ever seen sheep shearing, but it's, it's very violent. And the sheep get nicked and they're frightened. They're prey animals. So they get frightened when you touch them. And so when people are throwing them over and shaving them and stuff, they get nicked, they get cut, they're terrified. And ultimately they don't die of old age. I mean, the sheep that are used to produce wool ultimately are slaughtered. Silk is produced by boiling silkworms alive. Leather involves wearing the skin of an animal that's endured suffering and a violent death at the hand of humans. Now, I remember once when I was visiting the temple in Queens, there was a sign by the Darasha that said, no leather inside the Darasha. You had to take off your watch. If you had a watch, a leather watch band, or your, you know, you didn't have your shoes on anyway, but if you had a watch band on, you didn't, you couldn't wear the, you couldn't have the leather watch band when you went into the inner, inner area, the Darasha. And I remember discussing this afterwards with, um, with, several people. And I said, if you've got a sign that says you're not supposed to wear leather inside when you're near the murtis and, and whatnot, um, why is it okay to wear it outside? If it's, if it's, if it's offensive, if it, if it, if it presents some sort of moral affront to the, the, to, to the belief, in ahimsa, if it, if it, if it, if it, provides a sort of, if it's, if it's offensive to the belief in ahimsa to wear it inside the, the, the Rasha, why is it okay to wear it outside? I never got a good answer for that. I never got a good answer for that. The bottom line is that meat involves himsa, but so do all other animal products. Veganism is the only position consistent with ahimsa. And, and now I, I must say in the time I've been doing this, that I've been just talking with Jane's about, I, about veganism, I have found them to be a receptive audience. I think a lot of Jane's have changed. I think a lot of Jane's are moving towards um, veganism, but it's still um, very difficult. I mean, I remember a couple of years, a couple of, well, 
maybe four years ago, whenever the last, there was a, there was a Jaina convention coming up and I offered to pay for all of the ice cream and, and milk and stuff. I offered to pay for all of it. If, if it could be, uh, plant milk, plant milk and, and soy or coconut or almond milk, ice cream, you know, the no, no animal products. And I offered to pay for that. And I offer also offered to pay for any, anything that they were using ghee for, I was willing to, to pay for the, 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 you know, a, a, a plant-based uh, margarine or something that could be used in the cooking. So I offered to do this and it was going to be quite expensive. And I offered to do it. And I said, I will do this just so um, we can have a Jaina convention um, that is ahimsic, that doesn't have violence. And um, uh, two things happened. A, um, my offer was not accepted because I was told that this violated the principle of Ani Kantvad because I, it, it, it was wrong to tell people what to do. Well, you were telling them what to do because you weren't serving meat. You were telling, I mean, you know, it, it, this is what I don't understand. It, there's really no distinction between the meat and the dairy. And, and so I was told you can't, we, we can't do that because that would violate Ani Kantvad. Again, relativism. It's using the Western concept of relativism, relativism and saying that, that the viol violence in, in terms of dairy is not a matter of absolute truth, but that, that that makes no sense. And there's no way you can say that violence, vi the violence of meat is absolutely wrong. It is a matter of absolute truth because it violates ahimsa and dairy doesn't. There's just no way to do that. There's no way that can work. And so I was told, as I said, two things happened. One was I was told, no, we can't do that because it would violate the principle of any confide. And the second thing that happened was I wasn't invited to any more Jaina conventions. <laughs> so I think, I think, I think that I, I probably, uh, despite my invocation of Machami Dukadam for 4,000 times, I, I think I, I really offended people. Um, now remember all animal products involve death, but it's not just killing that's himsa. This is from the Acharang Sutra. The Arhats, Bhagavata, the past, present, and future, all say thus, speak thus, declare thus, explain thus. All breathing, living, sentient creatures should not be slain, nor treated with violence, nor abused, nor tormented, nor driven away. So it's not just a question of killing them, although all animal products involve killing them. It is a matter of, of not treating them with violence, not tormenting them, not driving them away. So depriving, separating a calf from the mother is himsa. Even if you don't kill, which, which is going to happen anyway, because you're going to have male calves that are going to end up finding their way into India's meat system. Um, but, but so even if you don't kill the animal, um, you still are making the animal suffer. And this is wrong. Suffering is inevitable in life. We are all going to suffer. But the thing of it is, is we are imposing this suffering on those animals. And that is himsic. This is from book one, lecture four of the first lesson of the Acharang Sutra. And if anybody wants citations, I've got, I've got many more. Um, but anyway, the final, the, the, so, so we, we, we can't, you know, the, the idea that, um, if we're going to involve, if we're going to invoke Ani Kantvad to justify non-veganism, then there's no way to, 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 to invoke, there's no way, there's no way to, 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 there's no principled way of excluding the invocation of Ani Kantvad to talk about the consumption of meat. There's just no way to do that. So if everything's relative, then murder, you can't say that, you can't say that, that killing human beings is wrong. Ani Kantvad. So you can't, this is the problem. Once you use this understanding of Ani Kantvad as moral relativism, it makes the whole system collapse. The system cannot sustain itself. The system falls apart because it cannot logically be defended. I would also say it's not just, it's not just veganism that troubles me about, you know, I've, I've uh, many, you know, I've read quite a bit um, about you know Jane saying, well, violence is bad, but violence that defends one country, one's country is okay. 
Well, well wait a minute now. Um, how can, it would seem to me that we'd need to have a very serious discussion about war, about whether war can ever be justified if we really believe in ahimsa. Because basically wars are, um, are they're, they're complex phenomena and they, they are oftentimes and almost always um, uh, uh, used to protect people's material people's material position in life. And, um, and, and so there's a very serious question about whether, um, whether we can, we can uh, ever defend war. It would seem to me that, a Jane, that the Jane position would have to be at the very least that a war has to be just before the himsa of war can be justified. But just to say, to defend one's country, you know, that, that one has a patriotic duty to defend, one, defend one's country and to go to war whenever told strikes me as being profoundly inconsistent with the doctrine of Ahimsa. I mean, something else that, that um, uh, uh, I would say, and I know that, you know, I don't really talk much about this because I know that I will never get invited to a Jaina convention for as long as I'm on the earth this time around if I talk about the problems of capitalism, because I do think that you know, um, many Jains, many of my, my Jain colleagues defend capitalism and think capitalism is a fine system. It's not clear to me that that can be defended and that there is violence involved in, um, that, that, that capitalism involves a certain amount of violence. We could talk about that perhaps at another conference, but I do think that, that ra- there, there are some issues raised there. But in any event, in conclusion, Ani Kantvad, Naidvad, Saidvad pertain to substances, not to moral situations. And these doctrines do not deny absolute truth. So using them to say that, well, there can be abs- no absolute truth about vi- the violence of dairy means that you can say, well, there's no, there's, you, you can use these doctrines to say there's no absolute truth about the violence of meat or the violence of murder or the violence of rape or the violence of anything else, that everything else becomes a matter of relativism. Now, I do want to say one thing that I think is very important about the doctrine of Ani Kantvad. One of the substances is the soul, jiv. Okay, it's jiv, pudgal, okay, dharma, adharma. Uh, and and so one of the substances is, is jeev, the soul. What Jane, what Ani Kantvad tells us, and I think it's a very valuable lesson, is that we cannot um, justify, we cannot judge people. Because unless we're Kevil Gyan, they're, they're, they're jeev because of the nature of the jeev and the nature of the interaction of the jeev and the karma. Their, their jeev is in a constant state of impermanent. It's a permanent substance, obviously, but it's impermanent in terms of its modes, largely because of the influence of karma. So in that sense, I think that um, we can't judge other people. So when, when I'm having a discussion with one of my Jane colleagues about veganism and the person saying that I'm not a vegan, um, I'm I have a, I I am morally obligated not to judge that person because I'm not cable gun and I can't judge that person but I can judge the action I must judge the action if I am committed to ahimsa it is what it is what the religion the dharma of ahimsa is is to take a stand on the absolute truth of ahimsa I'm sure I've offended people with Chami Dukadam, Om Arham, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Gary Francione. And it was such a truth and dare of the reality of what we practice and what we really are. And I would um, open the scenario for questions. If anybody has any question, you can unmute yourself or put it in the chat as you please. Hi, this is Sapan, um, Dr. Uh, Gary. Thank you very much for a very engaging talk. Um, I have a question. Do you think there is himsa in farming or agriculture? And what are the moral implications according to you of that? Well, of course, there's, there's always gonna be incidental and unintentional harm when we're planting crops, right? Um, we're gonna, you know, we may, we may harm unintentionally. We may we may harm animals unintentionally. 
one of the doctrines of Jainism, one of the, actually one of the most profound aspects of Jain Dharma is um, that uh, our, our living has consequences. You know, this is, the, this is one of the reasons why the, you know, the sadhvis and sadhus don't travel very much is, uh, is because, and one of the reasons why the, the Samanijis have to have, have to have special dispensation to come to America is because they realize that traveling and doing things, you know, that, that it, it, and, and one of the reasons why they, they have the murpati is because they're, it's a constant reminder of the fact that our lives as, as, as material beings has necessarily has a negative impact on other uh, other beings. So we can't avoid, in living in the world, we can't avoid um, uh, 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 harming others. Because, I mean, think about it. You, you buy clothes. The clothes are made by, you know, co in companies. The people are, in, are accidentally harmed in the production of the things that we buy, the things that we use. We build roads. We know that people are going to be killed on those roads when they're driving their cars and things like that. And, and you know, so, so everything we do has a negative impact on others. So what this tells us is that we should all try to limit our activities. Um, and, and number one, number two, we ought to try to consume as little as possible. And we always, we ought to try in our, in our daily lives to avoid harming as much as we can. For example, when I walk, if I, there's any way I can avoid it, I don't walk on grass. And, and um, uh, uh, you know, I walk on the sidewalk or on the street and I'm generally looking down to make sure that I'm not walking on insects because I don't wish to kill them. Um, and, and so, you know, it, being, living an ahimsic life is not just a matter of veganism is not, is not, is not sufficient for living an ahimsic life. It's necessary in my judgment for an ahimsic life, but it's not, it's not sufficient. There's other things you need to do. You need to control your consumption. You need to, you need to do watch other aspects of your life. Um, but if we all, if we were all vegans, I, I, and we all really did take seriously our respect for the non-human life, um, and the jeev of non-human life, then I, th I would think that we would all try to be more careful when we planted crops, we wouldn't use pesticides to the extent that we do. Um, and by the way, if we were all vegans, we would not need um, to, to uh, 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 we would not need to produce as many crops as we do because most of the crops we produce are being fed to animals. But yeah, so I agree. Yeah, th of course there's animal agriculture involves, uh, I'm sorry, agriculture, plant agriculture involves harm. But, you know, but that's like saying building a road, um, you know, if I'm an actuary, I can tell you at 50 miles an hour, 12 people will be killed on this stretch of road. But there's still a difference between building that road and, and murdering 12 people. You know, we still draw that line. So we can't avoid all himsa in our lives. We just can't do it. Um, but we can try very, very hard. And when we are engaging in the himsa of consuming dairy or using wool or leather or whatever, that's no different with my argument is that's no different from the, 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 the himsa of meat. And so if you think the, the himsa of meat, if you think how, you know, however, however problematic drawing the line is, if we think that the himsa of meat is on the side of no, it can't do that, then it's not clear to me how this other stuff can be on the side of, well, it's up for grabs. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. No, and I, I, absolutely. I think, uh, uh, thanks for that explanation. And I mean, um, age old or what sort of we have logically understood has always been that flesh of animal is to be absolutely avoided that's that's hinsa um but you know a, a product which comes from that like like you know cow's milk specifically i think that's the only thing i would say gents consume mainly from animals where maybe there is moderation there is not right it the, the it's everyone's personal truth there but nobody, I think, when they consume Bishan. at least things that the, the milk comes uh, as a from Hinsa or that, I mean, we all try to look grass fed and all that. But again, I think your, your points are very valid, sir. Let, let me just let me just let me just tell you grass fed all that stuff about about some milk being even if I, I would say two things. Number one, I don't think that there's any significant less violence with that sort of special milk, number one. Number two, even if there is, there is still 
himsa involved. It is not ahimsic. There's no way you can say it's ahimsic. But thank you very much for your question. Hi, Gary. Uh, uh, great talk. Thank Thanks you. very much. Um, hi, my name is Deb Mita from Orlando. Um, I had a question more uh, moral, uh, morally. Uh, you know, you're very good friends that you you feel are are doing hinsa, just like you described. They're probably vegetarians who are doing hinsa. Uh, where do you draw the line between, if you like, uh, educating them versus feeling that you're going to offend them, and that also is hinsa? Do you have a uh, an approach that you take that maybe I could adopt? Well, I mean, look, I always, I, I try to make a distinction. I try to make a distinction between judging people and judging actions. And I always say that to people when I'm talking with them, is that, and, and that, that comes from the fact that I do believe Anikantvad applies to, I'm not Kevul Gyan, so I can't see your soul. I can't understand, I can't understand all the aspects. I don't know who you are in terms of of you as a complete being because your jeev is constantly changing as a result of its interactions with karma and whatnot. I can't understand all that. So I am not in a position to judge you. Um, and so I always make clear to the people I'm talking with, I'm not judging them. What I'm doing is I am asking them to consider whether or not, I mean, most of the, most of the people that I'm in contact with are people who think animals matter morally. In other words, there are lots of Western people who don't think animals matter at all. So them is really not much I can say to them, but to the people who believe that animals matter, um, I always explain to them or try to discuss with them and try to engage them um, about, about um, how they can justify the, the, the suffering and the death that they're imposing, which they clearly are. And I actually don't find that, um, you know, it, these sorts of discussions, like anything that matters morally, um, e these sorts of discussions are offensive only when you make them offensive. If you don't, people get upset when they think you're judging them and you think that they're bad people. And I always go out of my way to say, look, I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm not, you know, I, I, I don't have that perspective that I can say you're a bad person. I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm just saying something's going on here that you need to take a closer look at and think a little bit more about. And if you care about animals, you really need to think a little bit more about it because it doesn't make any sense. And so, and I, I actually, you know, I, I find that, um, you know, that I don't, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know whether I offended the J, I suspect I did when I offered to buy all the dairy products for the Jaina convention, I probably did offend them. But, um, you know, but at some point in time, you know, um, uh, you also have to be careful about the idea that um, uh, that you shouldn't stand up for what's right because you're you're frightened of offending people. Um, I would I would take the position um, that that um, a lot of the a lot of things that we do are really bad. I mean, I think we're very unfair to poor people, for example, in the United States of America. I think we're very 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 unfair to them, and I think what's going on right at this very minute in terms of not, you know, letting, not, not giving people their extending their benefits, which expired last night. Um, and so that many people are now in very, very grave danger of being out on the streets, I think is horribly cruel. And now if I say that, um, is it going to offend some of my Republican friends who, who are not, you know, who, who, who have a great deal of, of love and affection or whatever for Donald Trump, uh, the answer is, well, it might offend them, but it's true. And I'm going to, I have to say it. And, and it's not, in my judgment, uh, it's not ahimsa, it's, it's not himsa rather, to say that we ought not let people starve in this country. We ought not have people have, being put out on the streets on December 27th. I think that that's wrong. So I think we do have to take positions on things. Uh, yes, sir. I just wanted to, um find out how you are separating actions from the people because you're saying you're not judging people you're judging their actions actions do not perform independently of the human beings that are engaging in it so when you judge action you're also judging the person even mm -hmm. though you may say that you are not judging you're still judging them so uh, instead of judging you know the educating part is good that you educate people about the uh, ignorance that they may have. And so then they can make better decisions. I don't think that you can separate the actions from the in individuals. 
Well, but that's that's actually not true. I, I don't I don't believe that. I mean, you 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 may believe that. I don't. I, I know many Janes, for example, who I think are really good people, but they're not vegan. So I mean, the fact that they're you know I mean I I think I think I think they're I think they may be you know um, uh, Plato, uh, the Western philosopher Plato, used to take the position that all wrongdoing came from ignorance, not from malevolence, and so. Um, you can judge the action as wrong, but not judge the individual as malevolent. And as I say, I know lots of people who are not vegans, who are very good people. They're just not vegans. And I think that their non-veganism, I, th I think of their non-veganism as in a platonic sense as coming from, from ignorance and not coming from uh, um, uh, malevolence. So then we need to have compassion for people that are ignorant and educate them rather than criticize them. Well, the problem is with that is that education, when you try, you know, if, 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 you're, if, if you're talking to somebody who's not a vegan, who feels very touchy about the situation, the line between education and criticism becomes very, very, you know, becomes very, very difficult to draw. And so if you feel very sensitive about something, anything that somebody says to educate you could be understood as criticism. So. You know, I mean, I, I think it's, I think, you know, you're, you're treating these concepts as sort of in a, in a box, you know, that, 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 that they're sort of a, that, you know, there's a, they're defined in some way and they're discreet and they're not. Um, so but that's I mean, why I was pointing it out because I thought when he said judge the action and not the, the people that you were putting the two in separate boxes, the action and the people. I am, I am putting them in separate boxes because I don't think I can say an action is immoral without saying that the person performing it is is acting malevolently. Again, I just go back. You can I, say that they are immoral because they are not engaging in moral action? They're acting immorally. Why they're acting immorally is a different question, but they're acting immorally. It doesn't mean that they're bad people. It means they're acting immorally. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. We really appreciate uh, your clarifying the different issues. Thank you. I have a question, Professor. Yes. This is Kirti Jain. Um, when we minimize hinsa for living, and that's fine, but still there is some hinsa involved in living. Right. So the implicit outcome of that is that my life is more important than yours. What does Jainism, Jainism say about it? And second part of the question is, is there any guidance offered as to where to draw the line and why is that relevant? Well, where you draw the line is, is, is when you're engaging in conduct that in actively inflicts suffering on, on other sentient beings. So um, now the, the, when I was talking with, um, is it Sapan? Is that the, the, yes, when I was talking to Sapan, um, I was saying that incidental um, exploitation, unintentional exploitation or harming, harming others unintentionally and inc incidentally is something we can't avoid, which is one of the reasons why um, I think it's important to try to live one's life um, in a way so that one is not, um, you know, one is trying to minimize one's impact on the earth. I mean, one of the greatest ways you can you can minimize your impacts on, on the earth is to go vegan because it, it is the single thing, is the single most important thing you can do to, to avoid ecological devastation. So you can, I mean, bar none, you could have, you could have five gas consuming vehicles and still have a, 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 a smaller carbon put, footprint if you were a vegan who owned all those vehicles. So, so I think we ought to do what we can to try to um, uh, 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 minimize violence. For example, um, even before the pandemic, I was taking the position when I was getting invited to talk at places that people would, in, would invite me and they would say, we'll pay your expenses and we'll put you in a hotel. And I'd say, no, I will do this online. I will do it by Skype. I will do it by Zoom. I will do it by webinar or what, you know, WebEx because traveling involves harming because when I'm in an airplane, 
you know, air, air, air travel is tremendously hemsick in terms of the bad effects that it has on humans and on animals. And so I've cut down my air travel probably by 90% at least, <laughs> maybe more. Um, so now the talks I do are online. I don't charge anybody. They don't have to fly me over. They don't have to put me in a hotel. They don't have to do any of that stuff because I cut down on that. Um, and, and, you know, I think just by, you know, I try whenever I'm going to buy something, I always ask myself, do I really need that? Is that something I need? And if I don't, if the answer is, yeah, I absolutely need it. If the answer is not, I absolutely need it. I don't buy it. Um, and, and so, you know, but I, I, I don't think what I, what I think is important is not to say that, well, since we can't avoid all violence, then the violence of dairy is okay. That's where I think we run into problems because that is violence that we deliberately impose. We make a decision. When I, when I have my tea, I make the decision. I'm going to, am I going to put milk in the tea or am I going to put uh, soy milk in the tea? That's a decision I'm making to impose suffering on another sentient being. And that's, I think, where we've got an obligation to sort of, you know, in the same way, you can't say, well, we're all, we're all responsible for harming. So what's the difference if I eat a hamburger or a steak? Because that's the same reasoning. And it's the same thing. There's really no way to distinguish those situations. So I agree with you completely. We live in the world and we're always going to be engaged in, in, action, which is going to have a de de detrimental impact on other sentient beings. We should try to minimize that as, po as much as possible by not engaging directly in a a conduct which imposes harm, murdering other humans, murdering animals, or, or consuming animal products that can only be provided by imposing death and suffering on them. All of those things are things that we can easily do. And then we need to do other things. We need to control our consumption. We need to control our traveling. You know, we need to sort of think in a, and we, we all ought to meditate. We, we ought to do preksha meditation. Here's my pitch for preksha meditation. We ought to do preksha meditation so that we can get closer to a state of, of vitaraga so that we don't come back again. So what about the first part of the question, which is philosophical, but uh, the question is any living involves uh, some violence, and right. and that's that's implicit uh, idea. There is my life is more important than yours because I need to live. I, I, is there any guidance or any statement in the shastra? Well, you know, I, I once asked um, uh, one of the the um, the, the Samniji. Maybe Sulek can help me. Sulek, are you there? Yes, I am here. Uh, Sulek, who was the Samniji who came? She was she she was the she was the rector of the Jain Visha Bharati University for a while. Sanamati Pragya, Charitra Pragya ji. Charitra Pragya ji. Ma maybe Charitra. Okay, uh, she was visiting. She was visiting um, uh, New Jersey, and. I used to go to the center quite a bit. As a matter of fact, they stopped calling me Gary and they started calling me Jigyasu because all I, I would sit around for hours and ask questions and we would have these, we would have these discussions. So, so when she was over from India, um, we had this discussion and I asked her that question. I said, does not Jane Dharma teach us that we should commit suicide? Because by living, we are necessarily impacting others and we are thereby elevating our, our, our lives above theirs. And we talked for about three hours on that. And, and she basically said, no, suicide would be the worst thing that you, could, that, that, that you could do unless you get to the point where your, your life is no longer, you're no longer able to do anything spiritual in your life. And therefore you, you fast, you fast unto death. Um, and, um, and, 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 but she said, but suicide is, is, you know, is the, the, you know, is not, is not permitted. So given that we can't, given that suicide isn't an option, indeed is, is something which is, is ruled out, then all we can do is minimize as much as we can um, the violence that we're responsible for. And we certainly can, can eliminate virtually all of the, the violence that we're responsible for directly, um, that we, in which we participate directly. And we can eliminate much, not all, of everything that we participate in 
indirectly because we still have to buy shirts and the, the, you know, the shirt's still going to be made by a company and there's going to be workers who are injured in the production, et cetera, et cetera. There's no way you can get around that. On the other hand, you can eliminate much of it by limiting your consumption and then just try to uh, you know, try try to move as 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 uh, much as you can towards the state of moksha, so we don't have to do it all again. It's the best answer I can give you. Sorry. <laughs> yes, is hello, um, Professor. Um, yeah. My name is my name is Naina Meta, and I'm from Orlando. Hi. And um, it was a wonderful talk, and I'm really impressed at all the things that you've done and what you were talking about. I just want to make a comment, actually, that I became yeah. vegan maybe over twenty years ago after um, I had listened to a lecture with some slides and video presentation of what goes on in a milk factory, like where the cows are kept for milk or where the yeah. chickens are kept for eggs. Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually what hit me and then made me, okay, this is it, I'm gonna become vegan. And my personal feeling is that eating meat um, is actually being, ve drinking milk is worse than people who eat meat because the cows are suffering the whole time in those things and when you take them for a slaughterhouse you know one thing and then they're killed i'm not saying that that's a less violence but just in the sense that when we're keeping the milk factories in production and the cows are kept that way or the chickens are kept that way we're actually causing suffering for much longer um, well i'm glad i'm glad you said that um because i agree <laughs> with you 100 percent. but i once i once wrote something in a jane publication in which i made that very comment and um, uh, one of my very good Jane friends uh, told me that that was not a good thing to say, that it would upset Janes to say, because I, what, I, what I said was, I thought there was as much, if not more violence in the glass of milk as there is in a pound of steak. And um, uh, my friend, uh, a, a, a very learned Jane man said to me, don't say that sort of thing, you're going to upset people. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you said it and I didn't, <laughs> but well, I agree. I, so I, I also haven't upset all the Janes that are listening to this, but that's just my personal opinion. And just like you said, I'm not judging anyone, yes. but just how I have been feeling and what I feel. So Michami do Karom if I have. I actually I actually wish, you know, I, I actually, um, uh, should have a little recording device that I wear around my neck that just says Machami Dukadam constantly because whenever I'm <laughs> whenever I'm talking to James, I, I have to do that. But anyway, so yes, go ahead. Other question. Gary Bai. Yes, Sulek Bai. Uh, I just want to make a comment. Uh, you know, I've been vegan for the last 35 years. And oh, yes. Actually, you know that. Hmm? Yes. And thanks to you. Uh, what I'm saying is people have this fallacy that uh, if you have your own cows, if you treat it like a mother, and uh, that milk is still okay. I grew up in a very small village in Haryana in, in India. Yes. And we had two cows. And this is a real story. And naturally, we treated it like a family members and all of those things. And we treated the calf as well. But what did we do? The cow has a life of about 20 to 25 years natural life. The milking is only up to uh, up to the age of 14. Yep. Still has 10 years or more life left. Completely unproductive, uneconomical. It's a burden. It's a white elephant. What did we do no, unknowingly? We donated that dawn to a Brahmin. Okay. As if we were doing. Now, our my problem, I just unloaded on the Brahmin. Unloaded on the Brahmin. Yeah. After two, three days, that Brahmin sold it to a butcher. Right. Exactly. Okay. This fallacy always huh, that cows in India were treated, as you said, always it comes from an animal. Any animal product coming like this is has a footprint of himsa, footprints Absolutely. of violence. Absolutely. So that milk, now I know, and that's why I became 35 years ago vegan. It never was hmm, uh, a, a, a animal. It was never was a, a insect product. There was always cruelty. Hmm? Yeah, and and you know, and the thing is, is that I'm sure there was less himsa involved in your in in, in that situation. But 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 you know, it, it's it's funny when you know you're here talking to people who are from Chicago or Los Angeles or New York or whatever, and they're telling me these stories. And I want to say, well, you know, you know what? I would disagree with you. I would think that there was himsa involved in that in that situation. However, you can't get that milk now. When you go to the store, you can't buy that milk now. So how can how can it be okay to go to 
you know, to the store and buy the, the milk that's got much more himsa. Um, and, and because you think that there's a way, possibly a way of doing it um, that, you know, that involves no himsa. But I think as you correctly point out, all animal products have the footprint of himsa. All of them, all of them do, all of them do. But I agree, but thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. Uh, okay. Many Jains uh, in my discussion would say that uh, Lord Mahavira and many other uh, Acharyas uh, that happened to live hundreds of years ago, they used the milk products and if they would have known that there is a hinsa, they would not have used it. And basically many times they justify that argument that it is okay to use the milk products even now in the temple by using a milk product that, is, that does not involve much hinsa. I mean, what, what would you say to that argument? Um, I would say this. I would say, uh, first of all, um, my good friend who is now dead, Chitrabanu. Chitrabanu used to have a, a uh, very, uh, I hope he's written it down somewhere. I've been trying to find it and I can't, but he used to give a talk and answer that question by saying that when you actually look at the scriptures and look at what was said, um, you really can't find support for drinking milk or whatever, or you're, you know, uh, that, that this, is, this has been exaggerated. However, it is very common in in religious theory, you know, religious doctrines, whether it's Jain or Christian or Jewish or Muslim, to point at things that people did several thousand years ago, um, and say, "Well, they did it, so it's okay." And and um, uh, and I remember there's a there's a friend of mine. Um, he, he actually sold me all of my English copies. Of, I, have, I have a complete set of the Agams, but they're in English. But I bought them from a bookseller in um, uh, India named Manish Modi. And, and, um, and I remember that uh, Manish um, was asked a question similar to that at, at a convention once. And he said, if Lord Mahavir knew everything, then he would have built TV sets and you know, several thousand years ago, um, and and that it's that we can't. Yes, he was omniscient in in the in the in, in a spiritual sense, but that you know, it, those were different times. I mean, there wasn't enough food that was being produced that where you could where people could eat enough. So perhaps it was you know to the extent that people consumed animal products, it was a matter of of necessity that they would die if they didn't eat it or they couldn't get good nutrition or whatever. Similar to the, the, the story about Jesus. Um, there's, a, there's a story, a biblical story where Jesus has two fishes and he multiplies them and he feeds 5,000 people. And everybody always says, well, you know, because there is evidence that Jesus was part of a, of a, of a Jewish mystical sect called the Essenes, and that the Essenes were largely vegan. They consumed honey, but apart from the honey, they were vegan. And so when people say, well, how could he have been an Essene? Because he talks about the fish. Well, you know, the way fish, the way the word fish was, was uh, 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 translated from the original Aramaic, et cetera, it leaves some doubt as to whether or not he was actually talking about fish or about food as a general matter. So Jesus might well have been a vegan, but even if Jesus wasn't a vegan, um, the fact that, you know, that Jesus was Jesus and that Christians believe he is God, um, you know, uh, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that we can't think rationally about, about you know, it, it, which, which, it, which more, more so in Jainism than in Christianity, Jainism requires that we always apply rational thinking. So if, if, if we were to uncover some agam, some, some, some hidden agam that said that, you know, that's got Mahavir eating a piece of meat, we wouldn't say, oh, okay, it's all right to eat meat. We'd say, well, you know, if, 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 if this is true, then he was wrong about that because rationally we know that flesh involves killing and we know that killing is wrong. And we know that killing is a form of himsa and, 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 that, and that killing is perhaps, well, among the more serious, most serious forms of himsa. Similarly, um, to the extent that the scriptures clearly, and again, Chitrabanu would say they're not as clear as 
a lot of Jains seem to think, but I'm not a, uh, I'm not a Prakrit scholar, so I can't, and that's unfortunate, I wish I were, but I'm not a Prakrit scholar, so I can't, I can't, I, I don't know enough to be able to, to, to make an, a, a, a statement about this, except to say that Chitrabanu, who was a very learned man and was able to read all these things in the original languages, said that he thought that this was terribly exaggerated and that one could not really find any clear proof um, that, 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 um, that this was thought to be an okay thing. Um, but even if it were the case, we as, Jane's living in 2020 need to apply rationality and say, okay, we're against violence. Is this violence? That, that's, that's the only question that is relevant. Is this violence? If it is violence and it involves violence, there's no way as, as Sulek uh, Jane said, if it involves animals, there's a footprint of Himsa, no matter how, how well we do it, there's a footprint of Himsa. And, and if, that is ra if that is true as an empirical matter, we have no, no choice but to reject it as a matter of rationality because that's what Jainism, Jainism says never accept anything on faith. Jainism, says, I mean, except the fact that there's, you know, that there's, you know, you accept, you know, the, 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 the three jewels require, you know, the, uh, uh, requires that we accept certain things, but not on moral grounds. Jainism never, there is nothing in Jainism that says you have to accept the, 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 truth or falsity of moral issues as a matter of faith. Nothing. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, it's the exact opposite. We're supposed to be rational. So the only question is empirically, does it involve violence? And, Thank and you, I, Dr. Gary. Um, keeping the time constraint, we have one more question, the last question by Dr. Surendra Bukhurna, and he's going to ask you that question. Go ahead, Dr. Surendra Bukhurna. Yeah, congratulations for your excellent lecture, Mr. Gray. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Mr. Gary. Uh, I have a very specific suggestion. Actually, this is uh, becoming a universal problem and now the question of survival of the whole earth is at a real critical juncture. And uh, as per some scientists, earth is moving towards sixth extinction. And uh, in the uh, last 550 million years, only yep. five times such extinctions have taken place. And that process has started. And uh, science, technology, and economic development, these concepts are now held responsible for this big issue. Now, the suggestion is that uh, United Nations has uh, recognized October 2, the birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, as an international non-violence day. It was declared in 2007. Now, irrespective of all the contradictions and problems in this, pro uh, in this whole issue, I would suggest there is a need to celebrate this non internet the international non violence day on october 2 on a very very large scale on the whole earth in all 200 countries so as to at least send an awareness about the need to save the earth in a very very serious way look i couldn't agree with you more we are in very serious trouble. Look at the fact that we have a pandemic right now. Where did the pandemic come from? It came from the fact that people are eating animals. All pandemics are zoonotic. They come from, they jump from animals to humans. And most of the time they're jumping from animals to humans because we're consuming animals. And there's, so, so the, the, the pandemic is a serious issue. And what is, troubling is that we think we're going to solve the problem with the vaccine. Well, the vaccine or the vaccines, which are available, they may address this particular problem, but there's going to be another one two years down the road if that if it takes that long, there'll be another one. And you're right, we are in a horrible, horrible situation in terms of the state of the world. Um, I wrote yesterday to my friend Sulek Jane, I wrote to him, the world is in, it, there's been no time where the world has had not had a greater need for Ahimsa. And unfortunately, you know, we're never going to do this by having you know, a Mahatma Gandhi day on October 2nd. This is not something you celebrate on one day. This is an idea that needs to um, be out there um, and it needs to be out there broadly. One of the sad things about Jainism is that because Jains don't believe in proselytizing as a general matter and because the Jain community tends to sort of be um, you know, 
Jains. It tends to be Indian Jains living, you know, and so you've got the Indian Jains who live in India, and then you got the Indians in diaspora here and the Indians in diaspora in England and whatever, and they pretty much stay to their communities. The concept of ahimsa is a concept that is extremely important. It is perhaps the most important idea that human beings have ever generated in, in, in all of human history. And so the idea that we keep sort of keeping this, this, this light under the bushel is I think really problematic, um, you know, and, and, um, and so I think, you know, I wish Jains were more active um, about uh, the doctrine of Ahimsa and, and the importance of Ahimsa because it's, it's what we're doing to the environment. It's also, it's what we're doing to each other. It's how we're commodifying each other. This is, I mean, you know, again, we can talk all day about, I mean, I have issues about capitalism because pro one of the problems of capitalism is we all commodify each other. Everybody becomes a commodity that we try to extract the most value from. And we try to separate, you know, we, we try to alienate them from their labor. That's what capitalism is. And I think that we need to really take a step back as to what it is that we're doing and how serious it is. Um, I noticed that one of uh, the other participants is, is, is Bill Terra. Hi, Bill, nice to see you. Bill, Bill has uh, uh, created something called the, the Human Ecology Project, where he sort of addresses all of these things about the violence that is involved in everyday life and, and, and how we need to, to, to take a step back from that and realizing, realize what it's doing. And and, you know, the children who are being born now, look, I mean, I'll be dead and, you know, I mean, but there are children being born now, you know, you'll be dead, I'll be dead, many, of the, but, but the children who are being born now, what is the world going to be like when they're our age? And the answer is, it's pretty scary when you think about it. It's very scary when you think about it. And so I think we really do need to, um, to 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 realize the importance of of ahimsa and and um, and as I say I just wish you know I've met very few there are very few non Indian people who are Jain very few I mean there are very few and why is that it's because you have to go look I mean you know the, the it's not like Buddhism where you know in America you know every third person is a Buddhist or whatever you know it's not it's not like that. Um, Jains are relatively, you know, are relatively keep to themselves sort of thing. And, and I think that, you know, although that's commendable that they don't want to proselytize, it's also um, sad because as I said, ahimsa is the most important concept that human beings have ever devised. And, and, um, and, and I think that we need, ahimsa is the only solution. It's the only solution to the problems that we are facing, which if we don't do something about those problems soon, we will destroy the world. Thank you, Dr. Gary. Um, Deepa. Uh, once, uh, Deepa. Deepa. Uh, please, uh, Jayupa, you can allow to Jayupa. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's only 12.22, I'm happy. I I'll go as long as you want. I'm a vegan, okay. I, have, I'm, I have endless energy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Okay. Franklin. Uh, my name is Jayant, and uh, I'm a ex-president of South Florida Hindu Temple. I mean, Hindu uh, Jain, Jain Center. Yes. Uh, my question is uh, just a statement. I want to make sure uh, to, that you can you can uh, tell that we have one we about 12 years ago when we invited Chitravanu, uh, uh, and we ha we had a publicly committed that we will never use uh, milk in our puja. And we are very happy to announce that to you, to, to tell you that we have never used for the last 12 years or 14 years uh, the, during the uh, very first day of the Pratista, uh, the milk, the honey in the puja and, and, and water also, because those are the requirements in, in doing the puja. So I just wanted to let you know that, and, and we should be working more towards that area. Now we, uh, I talked to you know, during our uh, social uh, lunchtime, I said we should talk about the uh, vegan, and then you know we should not, uh, you know, we should educate our uh, member about the, uh, bringing them uh, the sweets, uh, burfi, penda. I mean these are the things, and and warak. These are the things we should uh, definitely able to control. Also at the same time. We should also educate our uh, Jain family within the, within a circle, a social circle also. So we, these are, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a lot of point. I'm, I'm taking a lot of point from you, and we will discuss definitely in uh, in our uh, meeting uh, if they uh, if I can do. I'm I'm delighted to hear you say that, and and I'm sure that Chitrabanu 
Chitra, I mean, I was very close to Chitra Banu. I loved yeah. him very much. And he was, he was a wonderful, he was a wonderful man. And, and I, I always felt very bad that he died without there ever being a Jaina convention because he was one of the people who founded Jaina and, and, um, and that there was never a Jaina convention that was vegan. And one of the reasons why I offered to buy all of those, those non, those vegan products was because I wanted, I knew Chitra Banu was ill. Um, and, and I knew he wasn't going to live much longer. And I begged, uh, uh, my Jane friends to please let's have this conference vegan, both because it's the right thing to do. And because this may be Chitra Banu's last conference. Right. And, and, um, and uh, uh, but you know, but I agree with you. I'm glad that you did that. And um, I, I wish that uh, I wish I, what I don't, you know, the, the, going back to one of the comments I made before about not judging individuals, many of the Janes that I know who have said no to me are some of the sweetest, most lovely people I've ever known um, in terms of being really, really nice, good people. But they become immovable when I say to them, you know, because they're, I was thinking about a conversation I had with the head of a large Jade Center. Um, and I said, please, can this, can this be vegan? Can this event be? And, and they said, well, no, because it, people will be offended if you, if you impose it on them. And I said, but wait a minute, you're imposing vegetarian on the vegetarianism on them. Well, they don't want to eat meat. I said, well, that's fine. But, 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 why? I mean, you're not showing pornography at the convention. There's all sorts of things that you're not doing because they're wrong things to do. And and I just I just think that um, it becomes this this use of Ani Kanfad. It has been absolutely a disaster because then people say, well, I can do what I want because Ani Kanfad, you can't make a judgment. And the answer is. We're Jains. We got. We are obligated to make a judgment about action. What we're not. What we're out. What we're not obligated to do, and what we're obligated not to do, is to judge the individual. But I agree with you completely, and I'm no, delighted. No, that you... no, no, no. I, I, I want to make one comment. I want to make one comment, please. Um, I'm from Los Angeles, and I was a president of a Jain center here in Los Angeles, the biggest, one of the biggest Jain center. Three years ago we became a completely a vegan center. And in our center, any function that is done, only the vegan food is served. It's been for three years, including into the temple activity. And I'm very glad to hear, Gary, your offer. The last convention that we had in Jaina, I made them to force a vegan option if not completely vegan. And pretty soon, next one, two or three convention, it will be a completely vegan convention when you will be invited and you will have an option to pay for it. If you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, is, is it, let me ask you, is, is the, is the, is the uh, temple in Los Angeles, because I heard it was only for one year and then they were going back to... No. Since three years ago, when I was a president, it became a vegan. This year, there is a new president. There is a movement that might happen. It hasn't happened yet. And it is being debated. And we will do everything we can to keep it vegan. Okay. Well, because I had heard I had heard it was moving in a non-vegan, that, that they were going back. It hasn't, to happened. it hasn't happened yet. And we hope that it will never happen. And you know what I do every every year for the Jaina convention, every year, even when I was there, when, when I was at the Jaina convention, I would not eat. Um, and now what I do is every year I during the Jaina convention, I water fast for the four days. I just fast because just to sort of make my statement that a conference getting a group of people together to talk about nonviolence where there is violence being served, that there's something wrong with that. And that we need to take a step back from that and say, what are we doing? And so I fast every year now. Every year I fast for the four days. But, Thank you, Dr. Uh, Carey. To keep the time constrained, I would like to call Deepak Jain. Go ahead, Professor Deepak Jain. No. Let me first thank Gary for really an enlightening talk. And let me tell you, when it comes to the word violence, I consider it as a matter of degree. It's not zero one. Even having ill thoughts about others. I agree. 
is a great violence. You may be the most vegan person in the world, but if you have jealousy of someone, there is no less bad about that. So overall, as a practicing Jain, I am not a vegan. I try to minimize whatever I can do. I am not a fan of eating cheese and others, but I don't claim to be a vegan. My point to all the people that I have dealt with, that if you look at Jains, the three principles, one of course, non-violence, ahinsa, the other, anekant, and the third is the non-possessiveness of parigra. And I have a doctoral student working with me right now who is using the concept of anekant, how anekant can help in conflict resolution. Because as a management school professor, we all deal with multiple conflicts. Sometimes we become very dogmatic. This concept of anekant is to look at the full picture, listen to all the arguments. And as you said that, and I agree with you, that judging action and judging human beings are two different concepts. The man's actions, you can say, I don't agree with this, but we, we don't know the human being in total to say the human being is wrong or right or so. Same thing when it comes to possessiveness. I have always believed that people who are secured, they can delegate power. Insecured people are also very positive in sense of being a micromanager. And micromanagement to me is a manifestation of mistrust. I always tell people competencies can be outsourced, trust cannot be outsourced. So having this confidence and dealing with people you have to understand also human psychology, how people think, how people act. And as leaders, I've been deans and presidents of university, my thing is at the end of the day, you have to have a moral consciousness. You have a moral compass in yourself and try to act morally or in a non-violent way as much as possible. And this happens over time. Our I cannot force someone that this is bad or this is good. So Anikant, and whether it is, and you articulated it very well in your speech, that when we look at all aspects of Jainism, at the end, the most important thing is the moral consciousness that we have. Reasoning may have flaw, but consciousness doesn't have. And so when we use the word rational, and you are absolutely right that when I look at Jain religion, it's a scientific aspect to it. There is a rational argument, whether it is rational knowledge, perception, conduct, and others. We as human beings or we as leaders, when I was the Dean of Northwestern University, I cannot stop non-vegetarian food in the campus. But what I did was I increased more vegetarian options. So people get to know there are so many other good food to do that. I cannot eliminate, I cannot say I'm a Jain, so no meat would be served on the campus. But there were so many other options, vegan options, that people started thinking about, oh, I never knew that there are so many other things. So I always put in a scale from zero to 100 and how we'd like people to see there are other ways of living a good life. And one thing that I have always tried to believe is to think well of others because purity of thoughts, lack of jealousy also to me are forms of violence that we can, we encounter sometimes without knowing it about it or others. Deepak, so yes. I just want to say, I, I agree, but let me just say this. First of all, I think Himsa is any departure from Vitaraga. Anytime you are yes. in a, in a non-Vitaraga state, you are in a hymnic state because your yes. your soul is vibrating. So I agree with you. It's not just it's not just a question of veganism. It's a question of yes. being in the non vitaraga state. So I agree with that. Yes. However, Jain Dharma, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, does make a distinction. Obviously, mental himsa is 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 bad. If I'm thinking bad thoughts about you, or I'm thinking about you know buying more things because I want I want you know etc. But when combining the mental himsa with the physical himsa of imposing harm is 
is considered to be the worst form of himsa. Um, and, 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 you know, the one that generates the most amount of negative karma when one actually engages in violent actions towards another. Obviously, violent thoughts are not good. They attract, they attract bad karma. But bad thoughts combined with bad actions. So when I say, ooh, I really am hungry, I want that hamburger, I've got mental himsa, I've got the physical himsa of eating the meat, that is actually worse. And all I'm saying, Deepak, is that, yeah, you can't lead a perfect life, but just like we've drawn the line and said that, well, you know, there's a lot of gray areas, but one of the black, you know, there's, 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 there's gray areas, but one of the really clear areas is meat. All I'm suggesting to you. Please all unmute your microphone. Please mute your microphones, please. Please. All, 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 all yes. I'm suggesting is that there's really no way logically to more to draw a morally coherent distinction between meat and dairy. So Deepak, I ask you, please think about going vegan. Think about it with Deepak, please. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I listen to you. See, the only thing in life we have is influence. Yeah. Many people get advice, few benefit from it. <laughs> and, and no, 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 I, I'm, I'm serious. And it's not that I cannot do it. And it may happen one day as we all mature over time. Uh, we like to do, do, do that part. And I can tell you the only one drop of milk that I take in the whole day is a drop of milk in a cup of tea. I don't drink milk, no ghee, nothing, because that I don't have any taste for that. And I may become a vegan, but vegan to me is something that I'm on a journey. Let's put it this way. And it, it may happen. I talk to my children and they all understand. We should be, as you said, role models. My way of life is become a role model and let people follow whether they believe in you, they trust you and trust your actions and others. But again, just to respect time, I tell you, Jainism, as I always think, is a wonderful for bringing peace, harmony in this world. If you follow the Jain values, let's not use the word Jain religion. If you follow the Jain values, these are all basically making great human beings. And I say, the, if I have to think as a marketing professor of branding Jainism, we need to think of Jain essence and global significance. I agree. When people, yeah. when people ask me, Deepak, what is your brand? I say that I'm on a journey from success to significance. I've been successful. Now the question is how we make a difference in the lives of the people whom we come across. And I am the first person to talk about Jain values that I have grown with, what my parents taught me, what my teachers taught me. So I completely agree with you that yes, looking at you, you become a role model for us, a person who didn't grow up in a Jain family and have so deep knowledge. When I was listening to your talk of Nayadwad, Anikantwad, how deep you have gone, this to me is an inspiration. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I wish more such Jain scholars would come and enlighten this world. And we all will feel very blessed that yes, we have made a difference. I, I thank you. So, thank you. Say thank you so much. And all I can say to you is, I finished an absolutely delicious cup of chai tea with soy milk and it was yeah. delicious. I wish you could, I wish you were here and I could make it for you. You'd no, love it. No, no, no. <laughs> and, and somebody asked a question about almond milk and soy milk. There are many variations out oh, yeah. there. Yeah. So I don't need to have the real milk to do that part. I completely agree with you and it may happen. After listening to you today, while you were speaking and my wife was sitting here and I told her, that we need to move towards the vegan thing. And <laughs> Good. Convinced. Excellent. So, and she told me that from today, she's not going to wear a silk sari. Good. When I said that when you make the, the you are frying, boiling the worms yeah. to get the silk out, she was just listening to your talk and she said that let's not get into the silk sari. At least as you remember the story that a person was throwing the fish back and he says, how can you, you made a life in one person. So when people ask me this question, Professor, you talk about global significance. The world is so big. How can I make a difference? I have a saying to the world, you may be a person, but to a person, you can be the world. Exactly. What, what a wonderful thing. And they, this is to me the essence of Jainism. To a person, you can become the world. And if I can make a difference in one person, I feel blessed that I have achieved one level of one step towards Vitra.
Ah, exactly. The first exactly right. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I would like to call upon um, Dr. Ch um, Chaitanya Pragyaji. Yes. Samniji? Samniji, can you unmute your microphone? Please? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So, th many thanks to Professor Gary for very much enlightened talk. It is uh, really very impactful. And you have seen that uh, at once in reply to your lecture, um, so many people are committed that they want to follow veganism in their day-to-day -day life, in their family, in religious uh, rituals. So that is great impact of, of your talk on, on the audience. And uh, you have rightly said that uh, the Anikant principle is actually evolved to dissolve the metaphysical problems. But people have extended this uh, principle to religious pluralism and also the ethical issues. And uh, you have rightly indicated if we apply to this, uh, this principle to uh, such kind of issues, then it may lead to the collapse of the whole system. So we have to be very much clear that every principle has some limitations. Nothing can be universal in that sense. Well, thank every, you. Every principle has some limitations and we have to be aware of the limitation of all the principles, whether it is the principle of non-violence, whether it is the principle of non-absolutism or whether it is principle of non-position. So, met, uh, so far as uh, the question of the violence, which is uh, very uh, related to our day-to-day -day life and how we can escape from it or how we can abstain from it. And Dr. Kirti Jain was asking about the question that uh, when we say that we are not uh, absolutely free from violence or in our day-to-day -life, day life, we have to do something which is required and may involve some kind of violence. And is there any instructions in Jain scriptures that uh, our life is more important than others? So I would like to say that Lord Mahavira never said that uh, it is uh, our life is important than others, but he said that it is our weakness that we cannot avoid all kinds of violence. We cannot be completely sage or ascetic. Okay. We cannot live a life of complete violence, in, in non-violence. So that is our weakness, but it doesn't mean that our life is more important than others. We have no right to kill any living being and try to minimize violence. As Gary, Professor Gary has said that we can minimize to which extent we can minimize. That is the rational, uh, what we say, decision of all Jain people, if they think about it. So that we have to do, the social living beings cannot be completely nonviolent because of his relations, because of some of his needs, because of his activities. So just we have to think how much we can minimize. So mi minimal, violence or that is ideal for the householders. We never justify war, we never justify any kind of violence, which may be essential in our day-to-day -day life, but all are our weakness. We are committing violence and thereby we are committing sins. So that is never acceptable religiously, but socially we have some bounds and that's why we are doing that kind of thing. And this is the main reason that most of the monks and nuns, whenever they give any sermons, any preachings, they try to teach people that how far they can minimize their violence. So there are certain types of vows, simple vows in Jainism. And everybody knows about 14 vows which have been taken every day to minimize day-to-day -day violence. Those violences which are 
essential part of our life can be minimized to certain extent. So these are things which we have to understand that violence should not be the part of our life. It is not the ideal, it is not the goal, it is never accepted in Jainism. So that is a very great thing we have to think of it. And uh, it may be our weakness, but we can always think about minimizing the violence in our day-to-day -day life. And one thing Professor Gary has indicated that we should not be involved in direct violence. So that's why Jains uh, are prohibited to do 40, 15 types of business in which there is direct violence. How you can be free from this uh, involvement, direct involvement of violence, even, even you are in business. So these are the things that we, which we can see from the scriptures and we can get the message that not in explicitly or not nor implicitly there is any kind of sanction of violence in our life from religious point of view. So uh, we have to understand the limitations of everything. Yeah, uh, because of uh, being social being, we may have to do some things and we are doing that doesn't mean that that is the religiously true or right thing which we have to do. And we should not try to extend the limit in that sense, that uh, since this thing, there are certain things which are coming right now at present that there is a vegan meat, there is a meat uh, which is now plant-based. So that kind of ideas are popping up and uh, we are getting, uh, what you say, involved in that kind of thinking. But Jains should think of always that anything which may not be completely a uh, meat uh, product, even though if it is given the name of meat, then it creates such kind of uh, impressions of, or thoughts in your mind that you are eating something which is meat, though it may not be originally meat. So that thoughts also affect your consciousness. So thoughts are also very important. Thinking is also very important. So we how what kind of thinking we have to develop? What kind of practice we have to do and follow? So these things are important from non-violence point of view. And so these uh, all ideas are very practical, which Professor Gary has said to us. And this is the time when we have to apply our rational to all these kind of great ideas, which we have learned from Jain scriptures and from the concept of non-violence. And he has rightly said that Ahinsa, the concept of Ahinsa is really very profound idea, very new thing, which Mahavir and the Jain whole Jain tradition has taught from centuries. And it is our duty, especially of Jain community, that they should not be self-centered only. They should uh, propagate this great idea to the whole world by practicing in their own life and also through education. So this is a, these are very th important things. We have to think of it. And uh, this lecture series has gone from last nine months. We have uh, organized nine lectures of different uh, scientists, scholars of East and West. And we have found that uh, all have discussed Jainism in the light of science and has shown that it is uh, very important to think of Jainism in new light, especially in the light of science and also in the light of the problems which are emerging in the world today and we are facing. So we are thankful to all the speakers who, are, who have been invited in this series. Professor Gary was, is the last speaker and with the talk of uh, enlightened talk of Gary, this series is being uh, completed today. So we are very much thankful to Professor Gary for my accepting my invitation, though he was uh, not feeling good when I sent invitation, but later on he responded and came, uh, have come for this particular talk. So he has shown very good uh, uh, ideas 
through his speech and they are very practical they are very rational and we people should think that something we may uh, practice from centuries and they may be in our traditions acceptable but if we are finding that there is some kind of violence so we should try to avoid those things they may be traditionally accepted but rationally they cannot be accepted so we are not just only following the tradition blindly but we have always follow the tradition with some rationality and that is needed this time and we will try to think of many more things and revive our traditions which are wrong and we have to avoid those things and try to follow what is rational and true and non violent so with these ideas i am very much thankful to professor gary and all other speakers and also the organizers who are involved especially florida international university religious department is completely involved in this lecture series jain education research foundation is completely involved and jain uh, center of south florida is completely involved so i am very much thankful to all the organizers all the presidents and all the technological uh, uh, instructors who are working behind and dr pragnesh jain and dr d who is uh, convening all these nine lectures from last nine months so i am very much thankful to all the directors of jrf jcrf and fiu for conducting this uh, wonderful lecture series and we have got a lot of ideas from all the speakers which are really really very applicable and very rational and very scientific and according to the jain doctrines and principles so thanks to all again for coming in the lecture series and listening to all hey, the speakers may I, may i just say to samniji is it okay yes. say to samniji first of all i want to thank i thank okay. you for inviting me but i also want to thank you Uh, and all the samnijis for teaching praksha meditation um it was an absolutely it was probably one of the best experiences i've ever had in my entire life was taking the course on praksha meditation it's a wonderful wonderful system wonderful yeah i loved it um and and um number one number two i agree with you completely on the things that you said um and in terms of when you talk talk about eating the meat you know the 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 plant based meat i don't eat any of that because um unlike most jains i was not born vegetarian so i ate meat until i was in my mid 20s and i became a vegan and so i don't ever i don't ever want to be reminded of the fact that i ate flesh and so the idea of eating something that is mimicking flesh makes me actually sick um so i i stay away from that because i i agree with you mental him okay. is very very problematic um it's not as bad as as mental and physical himsa but it's bad um and and one of the things you said that i thought was great is that simple things that we can do that's what i'm saying jains most jains are vegetarian so they're already mo- much of my life samniji i i yeah. i'm talking to veg i'm talking to people who eat meat so i've got to move them i've got to i've got to sort of convince them that they've got to stop the meat and the dairy and the eggs and whatever Jains don't eat meat. Most of them do not eat eggs. They may eat eggs which are which are in cakes or stuff, but they don't eat eggs as a food. And most of them and most of them don't eat meat. So it's just a question of when you get up in the morning and you make the chai, isn't it better to put the soy in rather than the cow's milk? And that's it's the simple things and I think Jains can get there so easily. But thank you so much for everything and thank you for for all of the gifts that you and the other Samnijis bring to to the to the western world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for so, Gary. Thank you Shamiji and uh, yes. keeping time constrained and with the YouTube um, timings I would like to call uh, Sapanji in order to give word of thanks. Thank you very much uh, uh, Deep ji. So Vandami Samni ji, all the dignitaries and all the attendees here. Uh, my name is Sapan Bafna. I am the co-chair of Jain Education and Research Foundation. So first of all Dr. Gary, thanks for an informative passionate an energetic session today um i have not seen so much discussion so it was a great way to end the the lecture series um it is also my honor and privilege now to give a vote of thanks to all those who have made this lecture series possible um we couldn't 
not be here without the the generous support of our donors and volunteers so i really want to thank them first and foremost uh, it has been 10 years since jain education research foundation was established and we created the platform at florida international university um so really for our partners at fiu their support and kindness um really is very overwhelming this small small things have really got us to this point where we are hosting uh, such fruitful sessions um also samne ji uh, thank many people but i i just want to to extend more thanks to them bharti ben the jain center president uh, for the miami center pragnesh bhai and and many other directors there we are very grateful for all the support logistics technical and just your attendance just means a lot a big applause to our uh, ec president uh, uh, ms deep surana mrs deep surana she has worked tirelessly coordinated all these sessions so smoothly um, that it seemed uh, effortless when we all know so much goes into all the planning behind the scene so thanks very much for that samni ji vandami again to you and for all the the catalyst the the spiritual energy you provided uh, you know did not seem like 9 months have passed uh, and we had uh, nine excellent speakers it was such an amalgamation of east and west together to bring the pearls of jainism and with all of this so many great questions and and you know deepak ji and and others bringing in that wisdom that one small thing it sort of added in this sessions which makes it uh, so much better so really i want to thank each and every one who has made this uh, a great success samni ji we request you to continue the series in some way shape or form i think zoom is a great platform for sessions like this and we just need to continue whatever is the attendance i think this is a movement it will carry on uh, and i think it will benefit many of us so thank you and uh, have a great weekend thank you uh, thank you sapan ji and i would call um, bharti ben if she would like to speak something um, regarding her just Enough. one minute i want to take one minute that uh, from next time this lecture series is now being over here on uh, this was the last lecture in the series but next time we are uh, uh, thinking planning to organize some discussion on non violence how non violence can apply in our day to day life and how the issues which are coming be before mankind can be dissolved by following non violence so the next discussions would start on non violence in once in a in two months especially so we are planning like that professor gary is again invited for that talk on non violence so this is the futuristic plan uh, for this uh, particular program that how next series will go on thank you Bharti Ben, the president of JCCF.